Hi. Uh, I can't actually see any of you, which is uh, pretty good. I need to start with an apology. Um, this is my first TED Talk. Uh, there's 900 of you. There's one of me. If I pass out, can someone make sure I don't swallow my tongue? That would be really, <laughs> really helpful. Thank you. Uh, let's see if that's going to work. So um, this is what I'm going to talk about, how to row an ocean. On the 4th of December last year, I set off with three other men and we rowed across the Atlantic Ocean. And I genuinely believe that every single person in this room could do the exact same thing. And I'll explain how. Um, I need to do a little bit of a warning as well. There is a little bit of audience participation. It's really, really easy. Uh, we're going to start from the left-hand side of the room and then go to the right. Unfortunately, I can't give everybody a 20-pound note. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask you to do one really simple thing. A spontaneous Mexican wave after three. Everyone ready? Okay. One, two, three. Off you go. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Give yourselves a round of applause. That wasn't, that wasn't actually related to my talk in any way, shape, or form. I've just won a £10 bet, so... Uh, okay. The world record for rowing across the Atlantic Ocean is, uh, hopefully that's going to come up, 33 days. Uh, we did two years of research and prep. We talked to people. We uh, did all the reading. We um, looked at all the charts, looked at the weather patterns, and we came up with another number, which was 45 days. And this is the number that we told our friends, our families, the company that we worked for, uh, the media, anyone that would listen to us. And unfortunately, we were 59 days. Just to give you a sense of scale, 45 days is your summer holidays. 59 days, you've done something bad and you have to be locked away. So there's a, a little bit of a balance there. Uh, why did it take so long? The conditions. That was my view for pretty much the entire time. It was cold and it was wet. And in those two years up to before we set off, everyone had said the same thing. It was going to be hot. It was going to be sunny. You were going to have an amazing tan. Uh, it, they basically made it sound like a lad's holiday. And uh, <laughs> cold and wet. And uh, I think uh, you also have this rumor of, you know, you do a lot of naked rowing. And the idea of me being naked with three other men on a boat didn't really sell it to me, but, you know, the silver lining and everything. Uh, that was my view. Uh, and a wave would just come over periodically and soak you from head to toe. I want you to imagine... The clothes that you're wearing now are soaking wet and freezing cold. And you have to wear those clothes for 59 days. Okay. Uh, there's my uh, palatial cabin. I called it the coffin. That's about, about how much space that I had to, to move about in when I had to sleep. Um, I, I wasn't claustrophobic before. I am now, unfortunately. And people are laughing like it's a... No, I'm serious. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm not, I'm not claustrophobic. Just to give you a sense of the, the scale of the boat, it's 29 feet. It's made of uh, fiberglass and Kevlar. That's me looking quite serious. And uh, fiberglass and Kevlar gives you the impression that it's something quite secure. It's something that's quite safe. It's basically a plastic tub. And um, at the bottom of a 20-meter wave, and you can look up, and you can see fish swimming above your head. I never in my life thought that I'd be pointing at fish like this, by the way. Um, <laughs> It's actually really, really scary. But when you get to the top and you barrel all the way down, it is just, it's awesome. Um, let's see. So you work in two hours on, two hours off. You roll for two hours and you're off for two hours. That two hours off is a little bit misleading because it doesn't mean you get to sleep for two hours. When you get off the boat, after your two hours of rowing, uh, you have to do yourself admin. You have to feed yourself. You need to drink enough water. You need to... Um, clean the salt off your body because it will dry and then it becomes abrasive and then you have cuts and they become infected. So there's a lot of stuff that you have to do in those two hours. So what happens is you normally sleep for about an hour, hour and a half if you're really, really lucky. And because you can't really get a deep sleep, what happens is that you start to lose it a little bit. You can't dream. You can't get that nice reset that you would get from a, a, you know, a, a full night's sleep. I remember in the first week as we're starting to go through this uh, pain barrier, the sleep deprivation, I started hallucinating, and it was uh, three o'clock in the morning, and I'm rowing, and I look up, and there's a man and a woman stood next to me with a clipboard, and they're watching me <laughs> as I'm rowing, and I said hello, and they ignored me, 
And I thought, all right, I'll just leave them to it. And uh, thankfully, that was the, the last I saw of them. <laughs> just to remind you, it's two hours on and two hours off for 59 days. There's no weekends off. There's no bank holidays. There's no uh, day off. It's continuous. Two hours on and two hours off for 59 days. The camera. Right. So what happened was I started to notice that I was flagging. My output was... Uh, getting less and less, I was, my posture was terrible, and what happens is you mentally start to break down, you emotionally start to break down, you physically just can't go on anymore. And so what I did was I uh, had a mental strategy which was to create a camera which was just off the starboard side, my starboard side, and um, watch myself, and it was a perspective that I could be uh, a little bit more objective about what I was doing. And as soon as that camera was there and I could see myself, my posture immediately uh, got better, and I sat up a little bit straighter, and I started rowing a lot better. We are generally the better versions of ourselves if someone else is watching. Um, and as I was watching my behavior, and I realized that I forgot to switch the camera off. So for 59 days, I was watching myself, and I came up with a set of rules, and these are the hard and fast rules that hopefully are of some use to you. Uh, rule number one, <laughs> don't piss off any sharks. Um, that isn't actually a shark. I don't know if you can see that six-foot thing there. That's a tuna. And uh, seeing as I've grown up from, um, sorry, I've grown up in Old Trafford, the closest I've come to tuna is when I've gone shopping in Asda. So that was uh, pretty interesting. And that guy, I called him Ralph. He followed us for three weeks. Um, it was really, really cool. The shark itself followed us for about a day, day and a half. And what happened was at night, flying fish would fly onto the boat. Uh, they'd uh, die, obviously. Uh, and then in the daytime, we were washing them off with any other scraps of food. And we were basically creating a trail for these uh, sharks. So we, um, that was kind of our own fault. Rule number two, you are responsible for your own behavior. Um, this is a little bit of a touchy subject. It's been widely, widely reported already. But we had a breakdown in our team structure. Uh, one rower decided he didn't want to do it anymore. Went into the cabin and stayed there for five days. Um, another rower decided the best way he could communicate his uh, frustration was to physically attack another rower. So that guy attacked that guy while I was stood there on a boat that's going like this. Um, so that was um, a little bit scary. But you become acutely aware out there where there's nothing but ski, uh, sky and sea and there's no way to get off the boat and there's no one else you can talk to and there's nothing else that you can do. There's no panic button that you can press. You become acutely aware of how limited, but how potent your circle of influence is. You are limited and you are responsible for your own behavior. And having that camera there made me very much uh, uh, aware of my own behavior. You kind of put yourself in a movie. You see yourself as the protagonist in your own film. And you don't want the, the guy in the film to, you know, give up. It was really, really helpful when the boat capsized. Um, boat capsized, I began to drown. There's a gap between the oars there on the right-hand side, and my body got stuck in there with my head on the water, and um, the camera was still running. I could still see myself struggling to get back up, and I inflated my life jacket and crawled back on board, and I was very, very calm. I even remember thinking, this little voice in my head, wow, this is what it's like to drown. Okay. <laughs> I pulled the other guy on board, and you know, we just went back to it. The next rule, I have to apologize. I'm really terrible at naming these things. Um, the dirty minded of you in the audience are laughing. The quiet ones are judging you. OK, so uh, self-admin before self-pleasure. And that doesn't really mean what it, uh, well, anyway. So <laughs> you've been rowing for six, seven weeks, and you're knackered. And all you want to do is lie down in the coffin and sleep. Before you can let yourself do that, though, you have to drink some water because you'll be dehydrated, especially if you've been throwing up. You need to eat. You need to prepare your food for later on. You need to generate enough water for everybody else. You need to, like I said, wipe the salt off you. So what I did was, this was the rule. Before I could let myself lie down and try and get some sleep, I had to do all the other jobs. I had to make sure that I was thinking in the long term as opposed to the short term results. This was the harder one, and this is probably the more important rule if you're going to take anything away. Put your work between you and your heart. The day before I set off, I put this on Facebook. And uh, 
me and my wife, we found out she was pregnant, and I cannot think of any other incentive than having my pregnant wife on the other side of an ocean and me on the other side, and then having to row across to her. The boat could have broken down, and the boat did break down. We had no auto navigation. The team structure broke down. We had oars break. Anything, nothing could stop me. Nothing could stop me to get across to my wife. So if you're out there and you're thinking, I want to be a writer, for example, or I want to be a doctor, or whatever it is that you really, truly want to do within your heart, put your work between you and your heart, and you're unstoppable. And this is the reason why I think anybody could row an ocean. There's me before I set off. I lost 15 kilograms, which is the equivalent to about two and a half stone. I've put about five on since I've been back. Uh, and there's me in Almost Famous. And uh, I'm, I look so happy with the most epic beard as well. And I pretty much just ate anything that was uh, available to me. Um, that's pretty much it. You can row an ocean as long as you put your work between you and your heart. Thank you very much for your time.